God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace, brothers and sisters, are yours along with the cross that Jesus promises through faith in him. Amen. The word of God we consider are those gospel words, those harsh words, especially the first paragraph that Jesus uh, speaks in the gospel lesson. Um, it is an unbelievably difficult thing to think about from worldly standards what Jesus is saying here. Uh, but he certainly wants us to, to hear these words and to ponder them, for he closes this section this way. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. The top-line commandment on the stones that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai reads thusly, You shall have no other gods. Luther explains it beautifully and on its surface very simply when he says we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Simple. Kind of. Trust, I think we get. You just believe God. He's honest 100% of the time. His motives are pure. He says what he means. He means what he says. His motives are so pure he will not ever lie. And so whatever he says is absolute truth, we stake our heart on it. We put our hope in God and what he says. We trust in him and him alone. Fear, well, it's kind of been dumbed down, I think, in our day to mean simply respect, and uh, that's fine. I think we could probably stand to gain a little bit of the understanding of afraidness of God. Uh, I respect earthworms for what they do. They're God's aerators for the lawn. It's a nice thing that they do. They can catch you a, a fish in a pinch. I don't fear them, and I don't respect them near as much as I do a rattlesnake. I fear and respect the rattlesnake more than the earthworm because, frankly, I'm afraid of a rattlesnake probably wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for us to have a little afraidness again when it comes to our relationship with our God. I mean, if he were to come down, the living God, to come down and park it this morning right here in front of you, well, I'll tell you what, this old sinner is going to be just a little bit afraid of what that means. The living God who made all things, who once rained fire and brimstone down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, who once deluged the entire planet such that everything drowned except for a small boat containing the objects of his mercy and his grace, fear of God. Love for God? I think maybe that's a little more difficult to understand. It certainly can't be a warm, fuzzy feeling that comes over me when I think of all that Jesus has done for me. It's not momentary goosebumps when I'm singing an uplifting song. It has to be more than that. It's not some kind of Americanized definition of what love is, because I'll tell you what, the words that Jesus speaks this morning don't give me warm and fuzzies. They aren't here to give me goosebumps. They're here as Jesus says, for these ears to hear, to chew on, to ponder, and to meditate on. And in many, 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 many ways, what Jesus speaks here really defines what love for him, love for God, really is. Jesus speaks words to a crowd that is following him, a large crowd who, at least on the surface, seemed at least interested in him, uh, in following him and becoming disciples, quote-unquote, of who he was. And so Jesus wants to make plainly sure for all these people who were thinking about following him and making him one of the relationships in their life, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to love me, there's going to be a cost to you in this life. And the costs are these, as he outlines them in that first paragraph. If anyone comes to me and does not hate 
father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Such a person cannot be my disciple. If you don't hate those who you have the closest relationship with in this life, Jesus says, if you can't do it, you can't have a relationship with me. You cannot be my disciple. I don't know about you, but as I get older, I am understanding that really the greatest of, rela- of gifts that God gives in a worldly sense that are just earthly gifts, uh, that, that the greatest gifts that he has given me in my life are the relationships that I have. My father and my mother going back, well, 51 years, I guess now, um, what a blessing it's been. And that doesn't mean that I was a saint or I treated my mom and dad with all the respect in the world that they deserved uh, when I was a kid at all. But I thank God for those relationships. 25 plus years I've been married to a wonderful and a faithful spouse that I have not always appreciated every day. What a gift that is. As I get older, I understand it, Shelley. I apologize for for not being the, the, the greatest of husbands to you. My children, sons, as I, <laughs> as I grow older, what a, what a blessing. I just counseled a younger, a younger man who just had their first child. I said, you know what, it took me some time to realize it, but I realized that the most fulfilling and wonderful thing to do, uh, at least for a man, I'm sure for a mother too, uh, in this world is to raise children and grow a family. It is rewarding and it is fulfilling beyond anything that I understood at the time. If my boys were here, I would apologize for, to them, too. I haven't exactly been the greatest father who's been there uh, every moment of, of every day of their lives. Uh, I'm regretting the time not spent during their formative years, especially now, but that relationship is awesome. I've been a pastor at two congregations almost 10 years here at St. John's. Uh, I've gotten to know a lot of people, and I've loved a lot of people uh, through, through these uh, relationships, so... Ten years here with you, um, and it's been a blessing. Um, A pastor is a blessing to a congregation, but I'll tell you what, uh, you as uh, lay people, as the sheep that God has entrusted to my care as an under-shepherd, you've been a blessing to me too, and I have not been the greatest pastor. I'm not the best preacher. Uh, I'm easily distracted from tasks at hand by many, many, many things, and I apologize for all my weaknesses and my shortcomings relationships in life are such blessings uh, to be treasured. If anyone does not hate their father and their mother, their wife, their husband, their children, people in relationships in their life, they cannot be my disciple, Jesus said. Obviously, he's not talking about some gut-wrenching, visceral hate towards father or mother, husband or wife, but what Jesus is plainly saying is that a relationship with him may cost relationships in this life, even the most precious of relationships. Following Jesus, loving him, as our Lord and Savior, means that every other relationship we have in this life is immediately jeopardized. You can understand this if you've ever, ever shrunk back from sharing the truth of the message of Jesus with anyone for fear that it would somehow impact your friendship be a negative burr under the saddle for the family? If you've ever not wanted to hurt your children's feelings and so you didn't point out the sin in their lies and their deceptions, you cannot be Jesus' disciple. His work. In fact, Jesus says that the cost of following him surpasses even just relationships. 
It might cost you everything. Listen to what he says again. I'll read all the words this time in that paragraph. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What do you think of when you think of a cross? There's one right here behind me. When you walk into church and you see it, what comes to mind? It just screams Jesus, doesn't it? It speaks to you about God's love and mercy to you and sending his son so humbly in the flesh and blood so that he might be our brother, but so that he might shed that blood and die on the Roman means of execution common in his day, the cross. And so when we see a cross, I think it just it screams Jesus to us and all that he is. I wonder if it ever screams what your life is to be. If it ever preaches and teaches to you what Jesus' words here teach, that that cross that we look at and see Jesus lugging that up Calvary, Jesus says that thing there is the very thing that you need to put on your back and walk with every day of your life. The cross is a symbol of the world's rejection of who Jesus was. The cross is a reminder of what this world thinks of our Lord Jesus and by association, brothers and sisters, you, his disciples. The cross is a reminder for what it might cost us in this life to call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ because it might just cost us our physical life. There are stories that are told, and I have no reason to believe that they aren't anything other than true. You see them on news, you see them on uh, programmings, read them in articles uh, in the Muslim world where uh, Christianity does find uh, some inroads, secret little inroads, and uh, you, you hear occasionally of, uh, a teenage girl who, who converts to Christianity uh, and it costs her her relationship with her family who rejects her wholeheartedly such that her dad takes it upon herself to do the only thing in his Muslim mind that is reasonable and that's to take the life of his daughter. These girls pick up their cross, and follow Jesus. That's what Jesus says love for him is. He is more important than anything or anyone. And of course he is. Because he who first picked up that cross did it to carry our sin. Did it to carry our lack of dedication to God, our rejection of who God is. He picked up his cross and let the world despise him and forsake him and cast him out so that as his Father on that cross cast him from his presence, we might have hope in him and his cross that God won't cast us away. May God give to us through the message of our Lord's cross strength and boldness and confidence. Yeah, to face a world but to carry our cross carry it into the world.
knowing what it might mean. That cross one day, we'll put it down. Then Jesus will give us a crown. May he keep us in the faith until that day when we rule in glory with him. Amen. And may the peace of God that transcends all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith. We'll do that in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 